Okay, why don't we get started? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Parents and Family Day. My name is Jeffrey Bardzell, and I'm Associate Dean for Graduate and Undergraduate Studies. I'm also new to Penn State and the College of IST myself, so I'm looking forward to going on this journey of discovery together with you. In the college, we aim not only to provide a top-notch education, but also a great life experience. And so today we're going to try to sample both sides of that. We've got some of our best professors who are here who are going to introduce academic programs. And then we've got some key figures on our academic services staff who will take your questions and introduce uh, the work that they do. Please note that this Zoom session will be recorded and will be made available later online. Uh, and with that, I now turn the floor over to our first speakers, Dr. Mark Friedenberg and Mr. Bill Parquet, who will introduce the social and organizational informatics faculty area. Great. Thank you so much. Um... My name is uh, Mark Friedenberg. I'm an assistant teaching professor here in the College of IST. And um, I'll be speaking with you today about the uh, first faculty area on our agenda. Um, we have a faculty area called Social and Organizational Informatics. Uh, and I'll be speaking uh, alongside um, Bill Parquet. Um, we'll do introductions in a moment, give a brief um, overview of the uh, area, the faculty area, and what it does. Then the some of the related majors and courses within the college. Uh, give a quick look at some of the ongoing research projects that are in the um, SOI or SOI area as we pronounce it. Uh, and then save some time for Q&A. Uh, so again, my name is Mark Friedenberg. Uh, I have a, um, I'm an IST graduate myself, class of uh, 2006. Uh, I'm a Columbia Law School graduate, worked in uh, New York, uh, litigating cases involving intellectual property, uh, and securities fraud, um, but I have always maintained my uh, passion for the intersection of law and technology. So I'm very excited to be able to uh, kind of contribute um, to the uh, students' uh, legal education within the College of IST, which is a, a somewhat unique uh, offering that we have within the college, uh, and more generally the policy environment uh, surrounding IST. Um, Bill, would you like to do a quick self-introduction? Well, sure. Uh, my name is Bill Parquet. Um, I've been, uh, this is starting my second uh, academic year. I got here in July of, uh, of last, uh, of 2019. I, uh, I come from uh, 22 years in uh, active duty army um, and 19 years uh, with the uh, federal government, specifically the United States intelligence community. So this is my uh, third profession. I was lecturing up here for many years supporting Ed Glantz and, and, uh, uh, and, and other professors. And then I uh, just came up to our permanently. So uh, it was a, uh, a very, a very neat fit. Um, I bring, uh, well, my third profession. So I bring 40 plus years experience to the table. I teach uh, uh, introduction to security and risk analysis and uh, terrorism and crime uh, courses, uh, which are uh, been a lot of fun. Uh, enjoy uh, your students and enjoy, I think we have students in the chat, so I uh, certainly enjoy, uh, um, actually we, we've, I know someone at some point is going to talk about the mixed uh, method, but, uh, and other, uh, the current environment we're in, but um, I appreciate uh, uh, all the efforts and I appreciate the interaction with uh, your students and our students. So uh, back to Mark. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so this is a relatively new organizational uh, format that we have within the college. So social and organizational informatics. This is uh, an eyeful and a mouthful, um, but this faculty area is focused on the impact of ICTs, information communication technologies on societies and in how we design work and how effective uh, ICTs can be. And we are all living through a vast experiment in that right now. So we look at how ICTs impact uh, interactions among community members, uh, whether locally, nationally, or globally in a variety of contexts, and how those technologies can be an enabler for, um, for progress and for change. And so we look to understand how we can use uh, information technologies that exist <clears throat> and improve them to improve individual and organizational effectiveness, effectiveness productivity, and well-being, and there's been um, lots of interest in that, uh, especially lately. So we do research on issues and um, try to make an impact in areas like diversity and STEM education and in the technology workforce and computer-supported collaborative work and community planning for emergency management, uh, among many other areas. 
So some of the majors that are related to the work that our soy faculty area um, engages in are within the College of IST, um, Design and Development, which you may know is transitioning to human-centered design and development, the Integration and Application option, which is transitioning to Enterprise Technology Integration, and the People, Organizations, and Society option, uh, which is where especially some of the courses that I teach in cyber law and, cyber and uh, security and privacy law fit in. And in the SRA major, uh, intelligence analysis and modeling. So some of the courses that um, I recognize some last names uh, in the room, so maybe that you or your uh, student uh, are, are in right now or have had with me in the past, but uh, IST 431, uh, the information environment, and then IST 432, uh, the legal and regulatory environment of IST, but we sometimes just call it cyber law. And then IST 452, a follow-on course, which is specifically focused on uh, legal and regulatory aspects of privacy and security. Whereas in IST 432, we look at some other concepts, uh, most notably perhaps including intellectual property. Um, Bill, would you, uh, would, would you be interested in, in talking through maybe what you do in um, SRA 211 or uh, briefly describe some of these courses in SRA? Absolutely not. Uh, no, only kidding, only kidding. Uh, that was a deception. The, the uh, security and risk analysis, uh, introduction to security and risk analysis, is one of the courses uh, that I teach. And we, we discuss uh, the multiple uh, uh, SRA courses uh, that are covered within that particular degree field. And in uh, 211, uh, uh, of course, uh, the terrorism and crime. The, uh, uh, of course, the others we have are in uh, deception and counter deception. And uh, uh, of particular interest to me is the intelligent environment. Uh, so it, what, what I've found uh, is pretty interesting with our students. We get a lot of folks coming in that uh, complement the security and risk analysis of the minor with other degrees throughout the university, but specifically with other degrees within the uh, College of IST uh, and then vice versa. So um, uh, it, uh, it works pretty well and it, it's a wide range of, uh, of events and wide range of uh, education and, uh, uh, and research. Mark. Hey, thank you. Um, so just wanted to briefly um, give you a sense of some of the research that faculty in the soy area um, are doing. Uh, Dr. Yager is um, engaged in a research project on um, fairness and justice in AI software for talent acquisition. So this is uh, AI software for um, hiring essentially and for interviewing um, is becoming quite popular. Uh, and Dr. Yager is doing research into how people perceive the fairness and justice of the use of those systems. Uh, Dr. Andrea Tapia is doing um, really a lot of research in the area of um, classifying uh, crisis-related data on social media, so working with uh, emergency responders and trying to make sense of um, social media streams that may be useful to them as they engage in their work. And Dr. Carlene Maitland uh, has uh, ongoing research projects uh, in uh, Rwanda, among other areas, that is looking at um, IoT, Internet of Things, um, devices and making data available um, to researchers uh, around the world, as well as um, this is where the, some of the uh, collaborative nature of our work happens, some of the system vulnerabilities and cybersecurity vulnerabilities related to the use of these Internet of Things uh, devices. That's just a small uh, sample of some of the research that's happening because I wanted to save some time for Q&A. Again, my name is Mark Friedenberg. I've been joined by Bill Parquet, and for our remaining time, we'd love to answer uh, any questions. You know, as we're waiting for questions, one of the things I found to be of extreme interest um, is the research uh, area, uh, especially within uh, AI and uh, the Internet of Things. Having just come from the government, those are two very extremely popular um, areas. Uh, that are exploding uh, down in the capital region and throughout the world and throughout the specific, specifically throughout the country. Uh, and uh, uh, we're taking a lead up here. Mark. Thank you. Well, if there are no questions, I'll, I'll just say again, it's been, oh, I'm sorry, is there, uh, is that Ben, do you have a question? 
see a raised hand. I can yes, anyone who anyone who has a question, feel free to ask. Can you hear me, Mark? Yes. Okay. Just a question for a student who is interested in um, potentially uh, a law uh, degree after uh, the IST program, uh, what sort of courses uh, should that student uh, focus on uh, while he's at Penn State? You know, I, I think um, coming from any of our, our majors in the College of IST is, is a really great foundation for law school, both as a, it, it sets you apart from a lot of other applicants, um, but it also gives you the sort of the, the language and the way of thinking systematically that um, the law often requires. Um, it is, you know, I think taking a class like IC 432, that uh, that cyber law class is, is certainly helpful where you'll learn some of the uh, techniques that are used in the in law school and in the legal profession, uh, like case briefing. Uh, I think that would be helpful. Um, but beyond that, I think, um, to be honest, um, whatever the student is interested most in, as long as they are um, engaged uh, with the course content, I, I think that, um, People from a variety of backgrounds can can certainly succeed in law school, but if you go in having, I, the way that we teach IC 432, I think is not exactly the same as law school, but is a, a similar approach. We use the same pedagogical techniques. Uh, and so I think if that goes well for the student or if the student's interested in it, I think that's a, a great indication that it's a, a good choice um, to proceed. Thank you. And with just one follow up, as, as parents of a student who might be interested, um, uh, in that, uh, are there any resources or anything like that that we should try to make available to the student, like a you know an account with LexisNexis or something that you know uh, might be helpful to them? Um, yes, um, through the Penn State Libraries, um, all the students have access to LexisNexis and, and Westlaw and even Bloomberg Law. Um, there is a program called Explore Law at Penn State that's offered along with uh, the law school. Uh, and that's um, typically in, in the spring, uh, just after the end of the spring semester. And if it's okay, I'll uh, post a, a link in the chat uh, to some more information about that Explore Law program. It's a, a week-long program and they really get a, a um, they sit in law school classes, they um, hear from guest uh, judges and um, lawyers who come in to uh, give a really good sense of what law school is like. Uh, I've sent a, a number of students to that program and they've all uh, found it to be very valuable. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Mark and Bill, there's a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, from Kimberly Phillips. Where do students go to find research opportunities they can participate in? How are students selected to be on a research team? Okay, great. Um, thank you for the question. So we do have a, a website um, on, uh, a page on the IST website, and uh, if you'll allow me, I'll, um, I'll paste that into the chat as well. Uh, but I think the probably the best way is if students are um, interested in the work that their their professors are are doing to just reach out to them uh, and to uh, just to ask, uh, hey, what are you working on? Is there any opportunity for students to uh, uh, to work with you? I've read some of the research that you've been doing. I've read your papers. I should mention also I'm the uh, coordinator for the College of IST with the Trier Honors College. Um, Trier students all engage in research, but they're not the only ones who engage in under undergraduate research. If you have a student who uh, or a student who may be interested in doing undergraduate research, perhaps uh, writing a thesis, um, there is an opportunity to apply to the Schreier Honors College. Um, also, again, uh, near the end of the spring semester, um, applying to the Schreier program as a current Penn State student. Uh, and I can drop a link as well for that, so I'll put in at least three links. But that is um, really just not being shy about reaching out. Um, you have to um, uh, seek out those opportunities and um, more often than not, your, your ambition will be rewarded. Um, Bill, maybe um, yeah, watch room. I, I yeah. see that. Do we have time for that? So you I can, can answer it quickly. Okay. Um, so to answer your question, uh, SRA majors, uh, we, not only me, but the, the advising team uh, and uh, many other folks, and I usually point students that want to uh, complement a minor with an SRA degree uh, amongst our or many professionals that are on this chat and elsewhere within the College of IST and 
but our advising team uh, does an excellent job of that, of that too. So uh, a, any combination of any one of our uh, uh, degree programs uh, within the College of ISC is a very good complement to uh, the security and risk analysis program. Uh, and so we we always point them that the first question we always ask, and everyone always asks is, what do you, what do your interests lie? Uh, and um, and then we go from there because uh, they're not going to do well in a major or a minor if they don't have their interest there. So um, I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark and Bill. Um, uh, there's another question there from James, but I think we can hold that one off until a little bit later because it's a little more general. Uh, next, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Frank Ritter, who's going to talk about the HCI group. I wasn't a mute. I've got 30 minutes, right? You got 15. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> we'll let you know when that time comes close. Okay, fine. Hi. Um, oh, right. There's a complex set of interface here to drive this Zoom thing. Luckily, we've had a lot of practice this year. So uh, can you see, let's see, I didn't sk share the right thing, did I? Can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Right. Okay. I'm just going to uh, give the presentation this way as well. Uh, so, hi, uh, I'm Frank Ritter. I'm a, one of the first professors into the college in 1999. Uh, these slides were developed with Steve Haynes. Uh, he, well, developed with really means he drafted them, he's used them, and I've revised them slightly to suit myself. Um, I'm gonna go fairly quickly between the slides. The slides are available, and I'm gonna try to also address the, the questions and issues that are already arising. So, um, HCDD, it's Human Centered Design and Development, it's a new major. I think of it essentially as being well within the college from, from its initial days. And it's for, for students who want to design, build um, interfaces and evaluate interfaces. And that's core to what the College of IST has always been. Uh, it's replacing an existing uh, degree program and one thing that the college has always done is to, to try to chase the technology and to try to be at the cutting or even bleeding edge of, of work and learning and knowledge. Uh, the major topics in it are web, mobile application, how to design, uh, how to think about design. Um, sometimes we get down to the, the fundamental social and psychology aspects and uh, then research methods in, in HCI. Uh, I think I, I would, uh, Steve Haynes thinks about interaction design and evaluation and development. I think of it where computer science, psychology, uh, since I've been at IST, I add human sciences um, and task domains overlap. So you're trying to understand how people use technology. And inevitably, that means you have to understand the domain as well, or it helps. Um, there's a rationale that, that Steve put together for helping set up this degree program, that there's a lot of jobs in that area and they're, they're relatively well-paying jobs. And there's a degree, oh, uh, there's example positions. I don't think I wanna dwell on this. I wanna start to answer more advanced questions but there's a lot of HCI uh, related jobs out there in the world now, uh, a lot, because computers and technology are becoming very per pervasive. There is, uh, if we had more time, one could cover what the degree program includes, and it includes some programming and some people. And I like programming and I like people, so, uh, I like this program. There's application areas of where you can go and look for jobs. Steve wrote all of these out and Frank added, and wherever humans and technology interact. And so places as, as diverse as John Deere, uh, as well as uh, he left out the, the government and DOD, uh, 
uh, universities, the university has rolled out, rolled over or rolled out uh, several new computing systems that people use. And they're finding that it's uh, got a lot of interesting uh, topics in it. Now, what I've done is I've wanna, went beyond Steve's slides, but these are available. And I wanted to talk about a couple of topics that are being worked on and, and then say why you care. So uh, one thing is I've been working on tutors, uh, computer-based tutors, and it comes out of learning theory and human computer interaction. And we have a document that we're working on saying just how are we gonna develop these systems? And we're using a learning theory uh, developed at Carnegie Mellon by one of my, I guess I'd say one of my advisors. And we're using a broad range of human computer interaction uh, techniques, methods, and theories to make the tutors more usable. Not that they're greatly usable, but more usable. And to show a type of, of projects that are going on, we're, uh, we have a funded project uh, to build a trauma nursing tutor, and we're doing it with the College of Nursing. And um, in my spare time, <laughs> with a team of 10 other people, we've created a tutor called StopTheSpread.Health, or it's at, it is at StopTheSpread.Health. And there's a tutor and a book, and it's a, com it's a comprehensive view of skills to obstruct pandemics. It's essentially a, a hour to two hour long tutorial on how to wash your hands and uh, what social distancing really means and how it works. So you can apply it to novel situations and how to put on and take off and take care of masks and how to use hand sanitizer. You should probably use more than you're, you are using. And, and a theory of the immune system to hold it all together. And we turned in final copy for a book on Wednesday. And uh, we've had uh, over 200 users into that tutor. Uh, we have, uh, a, I think it's the first textbook we, we, that was written at the College of IST. It's really what psychology do system designers need to know? And it's published by Springer, which puts it in the library uh, I should want to, I guess I can annotate this, right, as an ebook. So all the students in IST can get a free copy of that by going into the library, and they can get a printed copy for 25 bucks, which I think is a decent price for a textbook. And it's been used by several, uh, several courses and several campuses of, of Penn State and other universities, including Michigan. But what, what it really is, is what psychology do you need to know if you're a computer programmer? So uh, the authors are uh, a researcher in Scotland and the director of user experience at Google. Um, as another example project, we wanted to look at how fast do people type when they're not doing a task for you. They're just typing, a, they're, they're living their life. Uh, and I've also given support, and I wanna plug this book. I get nothing. Uh, for the for plugging it, but there's a book called A Student Guide to Success at Penn State by a guy named Ed Glantz. And uh, I think it's a very useful book and I'm strongly encouraging my son who's at Penn State to, to read it. I think everybody who comes as a faculty or as a student should read such a book because it gives you an overview. And it's not an official overview. It's not an unofficial overview, but it's a it's a useful overview of what are the resources. Uh, within the HCDD area, there are uh, professors looking at health informatics, which means things like how do people exercise, how to encourage them to exercise, uh, and how to look at HIPAA-like topics of protecting your data or protecting other people's data. There's a uh, big and geographical data visualization by two of the professors, projects on better displays or better types of graphs or uh, fundamental questions of how do people read graphs or how do you look at a map and how do you display information on a map. Uh, I did a task with uh, one of the other professors about how to number the rooms in the building. You know, that's more of a human factors than an HCI question because there's no computers, but the same theories lay out of 
what's the user's mental model. And you might not want to start at the elevator where the, 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 the guy from Central comes in, but you might want to start from the east or the west or the north or the south. Uh, uh, there's professors looking at what's called crowdsourcing, asking uh, crowds to help solve problems. And I've had to add this, but we're, we're running studies remotely now and we're running it routinely and we're finding that sometimes some things work better now when we run remotely rather than when we, like I think you might have been found it easier to get here today than having to drive into State College. Uh, there's a couple of projects looking at assistance for partially sighted or partially abled people. And there's at least three people working on those and I think there's probably more. Uh, uh, one of our uh, senior professors is looking at how to encourage volunteering in the community. And how do you incentivize that? How do you record it? How do you get the information to volunteers? And if you go off into uh, the college's website, you can find a lot more about what's going on in research. And I wanted to note then before answering, I think it was Ben's question, but I'm not sure. Why? and what does research buy us? Well, it's part of the university's land grant mission, um, but on the student side, it's an opportunity to work in labs as an intern or as a research assistant. Interns tend not to be paid, research assistants tend to be paid. And I have had probably 20, <clears throat> 20 to 30 undergrads in my lab since I've been here, and about two thirds of them are paid and they often start off unpaid as class projects or just given a small task to see how they like it or they're given a small task so they can hang out and see all the things that go on. Um, because they do research our professors understand and and actually in some sense define the field. Uh, there's papers we write that are government reports or we help write the government write reports saying what should be done it helps keep our courses current and uh, we have contacts into the next Google or the next Bell Labs to help place students because the, they want good students and the good students want to be where things are happening. <clears throat> to ask the question of how to do research, I would go farther than what Mark said. And I would say they should, students who are interested should read the papers and the websites and you're gonna see who does work that's interesting not everybody who does interesting work has spare time or spare resources or a project that's approachable. So you may want to have students look at a couple people, but you can look at what jobs are going out on the websites. You can talk with your professors that teach you. You can apply for internships on our intern site because sometimes my jobs appear on the intern site because I've got two, I had two interns this summer uh, and we should note that the students in IST have to do an internship. Uh, if, if you're a woman or a minority, there are, there's a fellowship program called Wiser Murray, uh, which helps place students into projects. And I've had a couple of students come through there. Uh, you can put your research into your class projects and appreciate vague requirements when they're available. Uh, students often don't like vague requirements, but as a researcher, I love vague requirements because I can do what I want. And the last thing I would put up, there's a integrated undergraduate graduate degree. And so if they become partially interested in research, they can take, uh, they can take that approach. So, so that's the end of the presentation. We're into questions now. And, uh, Let's Frank, you, you've got a question in the chat from Michael Asante. What advice would you give to a first year PSU student currently in HHD college, but interested in exploring IST majors, someone with very little programming experiences who enjoys working with people? So HCDD seems like one potential fit. Ah, right, I, got it. I, I was like, isn't, that, isn't he already in the right spot? And I realized, ah, health and human development. Uh, well, I think the entryway into here is to take IST 110 which is the, the outward facing introductory class. Uh, you, uh, let's see, I know a couple people in HHD, they're, they're, they're good, but they're not as technology focused as we are. Uh, 
you can try to get programming experience. And I'm, a, I'm quite bullish on programming experience. I like people who are analytical in that way. My work tends, tends to, but not exclusively require that. So you might start to take the introduction to programming classes either in IST or in computer science or anywhere you can find it on campus. So, so I guess to summarize 110, uh, look around at the other forward, outward facing courses that we have and start to play around with programming on your own. R is a sort of baby steps towards, towards programming and there's lots of materials out there in Coursera and Linda and the library would also help you. Carmen Cole is our librarian and she could help you find resources as well. As, as well as could the IST Advising Center. Okay, um, thank you very much, Frank. I think we're gonna, uh, we're gonna move on. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Nick Jacoby, who will be talking about the Security and Privacy Group. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nick Jacoby, and I'm one of the faculty members in uh, the Security and Privacy Group and teach a lot in our cybersecurity major. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, which means I'm going to boot uh, Frank off of the screen sharing. Sorry about that. Um, and um, let's see, I think I've got the right, um, the right screen now. So somebody can confirm that we have the cybersecurity analytic and operations. So I'm seeing some head nodding is yes. Confirmed. Awesome, thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, so we're all learning a lot about Zoom and how different ways that it works. Um, and I know a lot of you are too. Um, so uh, thanks for that. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, some of the people that, you're, that you and your students uh, will meet um, in the, the security and privacy uh, faculty area uh, and, and match up a little bit about where some of us teach and some of the classes that we teach where you might uh, run into us and give you a little bit of some hints as to who's doing what kinds of interesting research and interesting work. Uh, so feel free to ask questions along the way. You can either unmute your mic or, or type in the chat and um, uh, somebody can keep an eye on the chat for me. That would be really helpful. Um, okay, so you know, some of the cyber courses that your students might take in the cyber major, um, the introductory cyber 100, uh, computer systems and literacy, You'll see some of our courses are labeled SRA or IST. Um, that's because that's when the course was created. It was um, uh, in that particular um, uh, degree program at the time. You might see if you're gonna be here for another couple of years, uh, we we're gonna change a lot of those labels, but the courses are gonna stay the same. So that introduction to information, information security, SRA 221, you might see that change to Cyber 221, but it's really the same course to get you oriented to um, uh, security uh, technologies and, uh, and how, do, how do we secure data. Um, the, the 200 level courses, Cyber 262, the, de the Cyber Defense Studio really gets you that hands-on experience. And then we have courses at the 300 level. Um, there's an analytics studio and an incident handling response writing course um, and uh, a malware analytics class. Um, at the 400 level, we have our network security, cyber forensics, and security management classes, and then our capstone. But how about the teachers, the, the people who are teaching these courses? Um, at the 100 level, you might have run into a few of us. Uh, I teach uh, Cyber 100. Uh, Henry Moeller has, ta has taught that as well. Uh, Ed Glantz is now teaching that uh, starting this year. Um, and we're really excited about getting students really transitioned from, hey, I can use a computer with um, you know, Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and all those different kinds of things, but what's actually in the operating system and how do I make that operating system secure? Um, so, you know, I, I hope that uh, if you've already taken this class, this seems really familiar to you. You know, the, the theoretic understanding of what a computer is and how do we represent data and some little bit of historical perspectives, but we really get into the meat and potatoes of how do we do like different things with Windows and how do we do different things with Linux. Um, and we take a little bit of a forward look on what might be happening with computing um, over time, especially when we, when we think about quantum computing and in terms of uh, security um, uh, related implications for that. 
At the 200 level, you might run into Dave Hoza or Anna Squicciarini or Xin Yusheng or even Peng Lu um, teaching either SRA 221 or, or Cyber 262. Um, and all of us um, here in the college, especially some of our tenure track faculty members, have really deep research interests. Um, Anna Squicciarini just received an NSF grant for looking at how do we maintain privacy of vehicle location when all of our vehicles are now hyped up with a whole bunch of interesting technology to give away the vehicle location and how do we keep that private? And so that's really interesting. Um, but many of our other researchers, many of our other faculty members who um, uh, have come to us as teaching faculty members have a lot of um, industry experience. So Dave Hosa, for example, uh, has worked in the, in, uh, in the insurance industry for over 20 years, um, uh, maintaining information systems uh, for a, a national insurance uh, kind of um, environment. Um, you might run into Peng Lu over in Cyber 262, and he's going to get you really interested in, um, you know, software security kinds of issues and, and how do we do things like buffer overflows. You might have heard about that in some of your courses, but, but he'll take you and you'll actually go really do it, which is really awesome. Um, and so that Cyber Defense Studio, Cyber 262, really giving students that hands-on perspective um, of how do we implement things like um, access control lists and firewalls? How do we use that Metasploit tool that we've all heard about? Um, and um, how do we do network-based intrusion detection by actually writing out some code to go implement it, not just you know, turning on a system and, and watching it work? Um, at the 300 level, your students will run into Johnson Kinua um, uh, in the malware analytics uh, course. And he'll get you really interested in, in taking all that, that data that we have uh, in cybersecurity and how do we crunch through that algorithmically and maybe start getting into a little bit of machine learning. Uh, so our friends from over in the data sciences area, you'll hear about that in a little bit from another faculty member, but we do have these crossover points with many folks. Um, Joanne Pekka um, is a, a security management professional uh, from her professional background. Uh, but you'll probably run into her in the writing course, the, the Incident Handling and Response course, uh, Cyber 342W. Um, Mohammed Becky just joined us from a career of over, over 25 years at AT&T as a technology implementer and security manager uh, for AT&T. So we're really excited about bringing in new talent like him uh, into our uh, faculty area. Uh, Chow Chu has been with us, um, I think, almost as much as, as long as Frank Ritter has been from early days of the college, and you'll probably run into him in a um, uh, cyber forensics class, um, but you might run into that at the 300 level. Uh, let me pick one of the courses. There's Cyber 362. That's that cyber analytics studio where you do some programming over cybersecurity data um, and maybe doing a little bit with R or a little bit with Python uh, and uh, digging into kind of the machine learning algorithms um, and doing that in a very hands-on kind of way. Cyber 366, our malware analytics class, students are really excited and sometimes a little bit scared about how do I do reverse engineering? How do I take a piece of malicious software and uh, tear it apart and figure out what it's going to be doing from a static analysis perspective? Um, so um, uh, Mohammed Mehdi is teaching that course this semester for us. Um, and our writing intensive course, yes, you know, we're all technologists and we like to get on the keyboard and do stuff uh, that's uh, very tech heavy. But we have to communicate that effectively to the real world and how do we do that to top level executives. Um, so our incident handling response course will really kind of get you tied into that. Um, and that's where you might run into Joey and Pekka, maybe run into me over there too. I teach that course as well. Um, at the 400 level, you might run into Ding Hao Wu or Ling Hai Song. Um, uh, they teach courses in network security and as well as uh, cyber forensics. Um, and um, uh, they're, they're very deep into the, the, the issues in, that particular, in those particular domains. Um, new to us this year on the tenure track side is Hong Hu. He came to us from Georgia Tech. Um, and um, I'm still trying to figure out exactly where he fits in terms of uh, the courses. Um, but uh, I'm sure when you run into him, you'll you catch his excitement about everything in the cybersecurity, more of the software security kind of perspective. And you might also run into Mike Hills uh, at the 400 level, um, and um, uh, he teaches uh, our network security class um, as well. Um, so there are a lot of us that do uh, different kinds of things. One of the classes I get to teach, and I'm excited about doing it uh, next semester, 
is our capstone for Cyber 440, and it's a large scale uh, analytic challenge. Our students are going to get somewhere between 75 and 100 gigs worth of cyber data from an advanced persistent threat um, uh, incident. It's all fabricated. I have some students who are working on building that right now for our spring class. And it's a very technically oriented, very challenging, but it pulls together all the different parts and pieces of our major. Um, and then, so I'm really excited about getting those students um, uh, that experience that they're ready to, to then go out into the real world and, and probably do some of the same kinds of things we do in this course on a regular basis. Um, but it's that very technically oriented perspective and then switching and being able to uh, communicate to our top level executives. I also wanted to mention, we do have the, um, the National Security Agency's um, Center for Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense Education. Um, that means that our program has been uh, certified, vetted by the NSA's uh, uh, program to, um, uh, to meet the standards uh, that are expected uh, in terms of cybersecurity education. If you're a student who's interested in government employment, you definitely want to add this on to your degree plan. Um, and it's the same courses that you're going to be taking anyway. Um, they're, they're all the same courses that are required in the cyber major. Um, uh, but that's going to be able to give you that um, ability to speak effectively to the, uh, the folks in the recruiting offices for the, especially for government or government contract environments that says, yes, I'm in an NSA CAE program. Um, and that might open some doors for you. One of the doors that it might open for you if you're a sophomore this year, uh, you can apply for the um, one of the two scholarships that we have in the college. The, uh, the scholarship for service program uh, um, matches up students to uh, careers across the federal government. Um, and uh, so we have, I think it's nine students who are on that scholarship this year. Um, and uh, they're gonna go off to really interesting places like the NSA, like the CIA, as well as to a variety of places across the Department of Defense and apart across the uh, Department of Homeland Security, even some of them down into the, the state and local government doing cybersecurity jobs. Um, there's also the, the DOD scholarship, uh, the Cybersecurity Scholarship Program, CYSP, um, and uh, we have seven students who are on that scholarship uh, this year. Uh, most of them are going off to work for the Department of the Navy um, through um, a relationship that we have with them. Although we have some other students who are going to different places across the Department of Defense. In, and these are all government civilian positions, GS positions, uh, that those students go to compete for. Um, so if you're looking for some scholarship money for your last two years of school, um, uh, that uh, I want to encourage you to apply for those. Um, both those application windows open up uh, at the beginning of, sp of spring semester. Okay, so it um, uh, looks like Frank Ritter's clock says I've got four minutes open for questions. And I didn't see anything uh, come in in the chat. Uh, so I'm really excited about uh, answering any questions that you might have. Let me go ahead and grab those links for, from uh, that. And I'll stick those scholarship links into our chat. I think there's some people in the chat. Um, so I see a, a question that says, um, uh, is the NSA CAE open for the SRA majors as well? Um, the CAE program, if you're in the SRA ICS option, uh, if you're still one of those students who's in that, um, then yes, that is open for you. But there's also a, um, a letter of commendation if you are uh, in any of our majors that's connected to cybersecurity. Uh, so you do have the option for that as well. And did I hear somebody ask a question on audio? And maybe I missed you. Nick, you said that the uh, application for these uh, scholarships would come out, would uh, be available in uh, spring? Yes, that's correct. So um, uh, right uh, towards the beginning of the spring semester, you'll see us release the dates. If you go to this, the websites that I'm putting in the chat right now, um, you'll see last year's dates, uh, but they're about the same time for next year. So think about that, um, just add you know, another year to, that, uh, to those date timelines. And that's when you should expect us to do those. We'll probably make the, the formal announcements for those to come out um, uh, uh, before the end of the semester. You'll see the, the timelines for that. Thank you very much. Hey, Nick, there's another question. Is the NSA CAE for SRA majors as well? Yeah, I just mentioned that. And uh, so the NSA CAE program is for 
IST majors, for SRA majors, for cybersecurity majors across all of our campuses. Um, and if you look at the courses that are there in the program for the, that, uh, for the CAE, um, if you don't meet all of those requirements, because you, uh, maybe the, you're an IST and you're only doing, say, an SRA minor, you might not do all of those. Um, but uh, you can definitely um, uh, still receive not necessarily the certificate of completion, but there's a, a letter of commendation. Uh, and either one of those can definitely be a talking point on your resume. Um, if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be glad to talk with you about it. Or Dr. Mike Hills, who's the, the PI of that particular program. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give back a little bit of time. If you do have some questions, feel free to reach out, uh, either direct message me in the chat, um, uh, or feel free to reach out to me at a later point. I'll drop my email address in, um, the, um, in the chat as well. So, uh, Jeff, back to you. Great. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, and somebody asked earlier in the thread whether these um, uh, presentations would be made available. One already has showed up in the chat. Uh, the rest will also be made available. Uh, and again, this is being recorded, so this will be available too. So thank you very much, Nick. Uh, up next is Dr. John Yen, who's going to talk about data sciences. So John, take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, everybody. I'm John Yen. I'm a professor in the College of Information Sciences and Technology. Uh, it's very good. Great pleasure to be able to talk to you a little bit about data science program and some of the data science faculty. So I share uh, screen. John? Yes. So here's a, we, we've hacked Zoom and created a timer as a background if you want to use it. Oh, okay. Uh, great. You don't have to use it. I just, you know, we created it for a conference and used it last week. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm also setting my own timer on my iPod. iPod. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Frank. So uh, one of the questions often asked about data science, since this is a relatively new term, is how is it different from X? You know, X can be computer science, can be statistics, it can be, you know, uh, other terms people may have heard about. So I, I first want to say a few words about data science, but sometimes that may be a, a kind of a, a catching uh, phrase, catching sentence probably is helpful. So one sentence I hope you can bring uh, with you today is data science is provide data driven intelligence to an AI system. So kind of data science and AI is very much related even though they are not entirely the same. An AI system is inspired by our understanding about human intelligence. Since after all, we, as far as we know, we are the smartest species in the universe. And so a lot of idea in AI really came from human intelligence. So in human intelligence, we perceive from our environment uh, through our senses, eyes, ears, and we interpret what we see. And then we predict based on what we interpret about the world about things we cannot observe directly or predict about the future. And then we make a decision and actions. And then the cycle continues. And some people refer to this as a sense, interpret, predict, action cycles. And data science provide a critical uh, intelligence to such AI system through the data-driven intelligence. Uh, more specifically, it creates so-called predictive model that enable uh, an AI system to do better predictions and, and interpretation. For example, suppose we imagine a, a, AI systems that monitor uh, patients after a surgery. Could be heart surgery, could be other surgery. Uh, and you can imagine the AI system uh, will consist of wearable sensors because wearable sensor enable uh, the, the patient's condition to be monitored 24 seven. And that interpret then based on the sensor then uh, the state of the patient will be uh, continually monitor, update, and more importantly, to be able to predict uh, whether there will be risk of these patients in the coming, you know, one hour, five hour, 10 hour, 24 hours, and so on. And, and then based on that prediction to take preventive action to alert or to uh, even uh, send a kind of a signals to 911 or to hospitals. And 
the the key of such an intelligent system is the capability to do uh, critical predictions and we call these models predictive model and they came from machine learning and data science uh, based on uh, th this particular uh, survey uh, AI and data science and machine learning en engineers uh, are uh, very uh, have a very promising career and we have seen uh, report like this in, in other uh, sources. They are all surveyed uh, across industry sectors about what they see in terms of the potential importance of data science or big data. And most of the industry sector actually uh, see that as either critical or very important or important. And these are some of the skill set also being identified as critically important uh, for data science related career. And this is kind of a simple mapping of how our courses are related, provide knowledge and skills uh, identified by these, uh, um, these surveys. Even though the courses were created independent of this survey, and, would, and but this is kind of a good example to demonstrate that uh, the data science education provides solid knowledge and skills uh, to prepare students for this exciting career. Uh, the curriculum of data science also include the courses that draw, draw from uh, different uh, colleges, including uh, from uh, computer science, from statistics, uh, but it also add additional important elements uh, for data science uh, education, uh, as well as understanding about critical privacy and ethics issue, uh, Mark earlier talked about the human dimensions of the college, and obviously that is also very important in the data science education. Uh, there are also a very important uh, application focus area uh, for uh, the data science um, uh, education. Uh, and, that, uh, and, and like uh, the cyber uh, program, we also have capstone courses. And we also have a uh, Sharon who is the application, uh, who is the data science pro program coordinator here. Uh, Sharon, would you like to say a few words about the application focus area? Hi, everyone. Uh, sure, I'll be happy to. So the application focus areas um, is a key feature of our data sciences program. Uh, we advise our students early on in the first two years um, that they should look for another discipline that they are interested in applying data science to solve problems in that, uh, in that domain. Uh, on the slide, you can see some of the focus areas that we have developed in life sciences, health sciences, uh, sustainability, physical sciences, business, and so on. Um, this way, students can plan their four core sequence in an application focus area, area early on. Uh, they can, you know, take some lower level courses, typically two lower level courses uh, as prerequisites to two higher level, like 300, 400 level courses in that area. This way, beside data science, they also have the breadth and depth in another area uh, and they can apply the techniques um, and the skills that they have learned in data science to solve important problems seen in these other areas that they have chosen. So we have seen students uh, who have who are interested in, for instance, applying data science to business analytics, uh, to life sciences, to health sciences, among others. Thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, and uh, is Mark here? Mark? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. <laughs> so Mark is uh, one of our uh, key faculty member of the data science uh, program. And he will talk about, uh, in addition to uh, Capstone, he also has uh, taught uh, Data Science 220 and other courses. Uh, but here we are, he will share some of the interesting Capstone project uh, his student has developed. Mark? Yeah, just really quickly. So when, you're, when the students reach their senior year, um, usually their last uh, one or two semesters, they take like in other uh, majors, uh, capstone experience. And this gives them an opportunity to do data science, typically for an industry or a university sponsor. So they're really working on a small team of students, just like they will in their first jobs, a team of data scientists, but they'll have to communicate 
with uh, people who may not, um, you know, uh, in industry who may not speak data science. And so we have a couple interesting projects that have come up uh, recently, and I'm happy to talk to anyone else about the capstone experience. Um, in this one that was uh, from spring semester 2020, a team of students was working with a uh, sponsor at MIT Lincoln Lab, and they were uh, also engaged with the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Amazon Web Services to develop artificial intelligence solutions to look at aerial images from civilian aerial photographs and try to um, identify natural disasters. If you look at this picture from far away, for example, it's hard to tell whether this might be some sort of a lake, a beautiful lake resort community, uh, or a flood, right? And uh, it's challenging for a human to do that. Sometimes it's even more challenging for a computer. And the student team was able to develop a method to automatically identify images of disasters, different natural disasters with 80% accuracy. And this was integrated into an existing solution used by the um, New Jersey Office of Homeland, Secur uh, Homeland Security. And the students actually went to a conference, a professional conference, and published their results there and talked about it. Great. So the uh, next one real quick. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of time, but this is one from this semester just to show you how they're doing some timely things. Uh, this is a team this semester who's working for uh, Penn State Hershey Medical Center, very large medical center in central Pennsylvania. And they're, uh, it's a team of mixed industrial engineering and data science students, and they're developing a system to address critical PPE shortages throughout the health system. When PPE masks and gloves and things like that are distributed across the health system, you can imagine there's many, many different nursing stations. Uh, it's hard to keep track of stocks and to know when to order. You know, you don't want to order too much because stuff might not be available or might be too expensive at a certain time. You want to order just as much as you need and you want to be able to predict when stocks are going to be running low. So that's what the team is working on this semester. Thank you, Mark. Speaking of COVID, actually, uh, it also uh, uh, provide a natural transition into um, uh, Justin, because he's one of our faculty members who has done very interesting research, especially uh, on COVID related. Justin? Hi, so thanks for having me. Um, uh, so uh, I recently moved to Penn State just at the beginning of the year, and I was hoping for pretty quiet transition, um, but um, you know, unfortunately COVID happened and uh, a lot of my research is in the analysis of biomedical data and epidemiology and ended up in a bit of a, um, an interesting place where I started um, tracking the outbreak around the world and noticing that um, the number of cases were not making sense with the rate of growth. Um, basically, the short story was that we ended up finding that about 80 times more people in the U.S. had been infected in, um, in the month of March than were officially reported. And oh, sure. this ended up sort of going uh, um, uh, to the highest levels of uh, government and public policy. Um, and it's been sort of a wild ride ever since. But uh, yeah, happy to take questions or you know, chat about it um, offline. Oh, and I, and I didn't realize Justin was going to be here today, but he's also advising one of the capstone teams this semester on a project related to this, which is great. great. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, next great. thank you. I'll be teaching the machine learning course. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. And then Justin also bring a very unique combination of uh, both PhD and uh, MD into our college. And he will strengthen our bridge, which already uh, is uh, already have some other faculty, but he certainly will bring a unique uh, expertise to help us to strengthen our research connecting to health related challenges. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. And uh, Sharon actually also has done a lot of interesting work related to biomedical images. Sharon. Hi. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'm Sharon Huang. I just uh, talked to you earlier about the application focus areas uh, because I serve as the data science program coordinator. And in this role, I oversee the curriculum enhancement and also advising of students. Uh, for instance, I advise a lot of students and help them develop their application focus areas. And this semester, I'm also teaching one section of a freshman seminar for data science students. And besides my service work, um, of course, my other activities center around my research and teaching. For my research, I work on developing uh, machine learning systems for biomedical imaging analy analytics applications. For instance, uh, in this picture showing the slide, 
Uh, in this example, we are uh, developing a machine learning system for analyzing MRI images of the brain to automatically delineate the boundary of brain tumors. Because if you know the boundaries, that will be helpful for radiation therapy planning, uh, quantitative measurement of tumor size changes over time, and so on. And in other works, we have developed uh, methods and systems for early detection and diagnosis of cancer. Um, and right now, we're also working with uh, physicists and material scientists to develop a handheld device for automatic virus identification using signatures of these viruses. Uh, for instance, uh, you can use machine learning to analyze Raman spectroscopy data of viruses and then find signatures uh, that indicate which virus this is. Um, and so that's you know, some example research work that I have been doing. For my teaching, I have been teaching data science courses. For instance, I teach uh, DS220, that is the data management course, and that is a core course um, for all DS students. I also taught DS330, which is uh, data visualization. And in that course, we introduce techniques to create viral representations of data and also uh, present those uh, using dynamic web pages. And also we teach students how to present their findings in viral form in reports and so on. And that's me, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Vasan, are you here? Uh, so Dr. Vasan Hunova is also a uh, one key faculty member here, he also is a national leader in many areas related to data science, machine learning. Uh, and I just want to also mention that uh, he also played a critical role in the data science curriculum, including designing uh, important courses, designing the curriculum, and also uh, teach, he has taught machine learning course and other uh, courses. So uh, I just want to stop here to see whether anybody have any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? There are some general questions that we will uh, answer uh, in the general Q&A and we'll also get the URLs posted, but any questions for data science specifically? Okay. Oh. Oh no, that's Frank. Okay. All right, in that case, let's, uh, let's thank the data science group for their presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll move on to the, uh, the final segment uh, today, uh, which is our academic services introductions and Q&A. Uh, and we will have a panel presentation by Angela Miller, Zoe Meyer, Susan Agee, and Mathavi Kari. So uh, let's welcome all of them. Good morning. So I'm Angela Miller and I serve as the Director of Undergraduate Recruiting and Student Engagement for the College of IST. So that's a whole lot of title to go for one job, but I wanted to just welcome everybody today and say that the first time you might see myself or my staff is when your students are in high school and they might be interested in learning more about the college. And so that's the recruiting side of the job that I do. And then student engagement is something that we handle once the students are actually present physically or remotely um, with us at Penn State in the College of IST. And essentially what that does is we assist students with finding different groups of people that they might want to connect with to learn more about either uh, topic areas in their major or just connect with other college students with a common goal or a common interest. Um, it's all of the co-curricular learning that takes place outside of the classroom. So study abroad is included in that particular portfolio as well as um, assisting our undergraduate research um, and helping students find their fit there. Um, so I'm happy to take questions about anything that we do, but I'll go ahead and turn it over to the rest of my colleagues. I can go. Hi, uh, my name is Zoe Meyer and I'm the director for the Office of Career Solutions and Corporate Engagement. So our office is primarily responsible for helping, um, I know both students and parents are on, so the students become professionally ready um, for their careers, their full-time careers, and for their internships. So we work uh, 
very closely with the employers that are recruiting our students and um, very closely with just about every single student and helping them with resumes, interview prep, um, understanding our job posting system. Um, we manage the career fairs in the college, which our first one was virtual this year and actually went over pretty well. So we were happy about that. Um, we are still providing a lot of opportunities for students, even though they are virtual this year, there's still a lot of employers and a lot of opportunities um, for students to engage with these recruiters. So I'm also happy to answer any questions and we're glad that you're here. Okay, so I'm Susan Agee and I'm the director of the Undergraduate Advising Center. And our office works to support students um, by helping them explore and identify academic goals, um, navigate this thing called Penn State University with policies and procedures. There's a lot of those things uh, that are sometimes confusing and so we're, we're here to help students with that. Um, but we are also um, interested in making sure that students become self-directed learners and decision makers, right? So um, this is just a short uh, time that they're spending with us, but you know, hopefully we're helping them to prepare uh, for their future. So, um, but we're also here if students are struggling, right? So if the students are struggling in their courses or they're having challenges outside the classroom, then we're, help, we're here to help them um, with any kind of, you know, finding resources or academic support that would be uh, appropriate for that particular situation. Uh, right now, um, we are assisting students with planning their spring schedules and reviewing graduation requirements. Um, so to all you students out there, make sure you're connecting with your advisor. Everybody gets an assigned advisor from uh, when they come through our um, new student orientation or when they actually join the major. So everybody should have an assigned advisor um, and we want to make sure that you're ready to schedule courses when that becomes available. Uh, right now, um, because of the, the, uh, the way that courses are being offered this semester, you know, with a remote learning and um, mixed mode learning, um, we're still trying to figure that out for the spring semester. And so uh, registration has been delayed a little bit, um, but we're hoping uh, to get everybody through registration uh, in the month of um, uh, November. So we're hoping things will start in October, mid-October, end of October, and then to be wrapped up by um, the end of November. So somewhat similar, you know, and we are working uh, virtually like um, a lot of our colleagues, uh, but you know, you can make an appointment through Starfish um, and we're still here to help you. So welcome and um, I look forward to your questions. Hi everyone, my name is Madhavi Carey. I'm the um, Assistant Director for the Office of Inclusion and Diversity Engagement. So our office is here um, to continue to build, foster, and support a welcoming environment for all faculty, staff, and students. And what we do for students, we connect students with resources and various professional and academic opportunities they need to succeed and thrive here at Penn State and in the future. And welcome, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. going to hop in because I saw that there was a question in regards to freshmen um, doing internships and we do get that question a lot because I know it can be a little discouraging when freshmen go to career fairs and they say oh, we're interested in primarily juniors or come back in a couple of years so um, I understand that frustration however that is not for every company um, a lot of places it might be a, maybe a smaller company that they can start with just to get their feet wet and maybe not go for one of the large you know, Fortune 500 companies right off the bat, because oftentimes they do look for juniors or um, upperclassmen. So I would encourage students who are freshmen to maybe look for a smaller company or even not take the internship piece out of it altogether and not so much focus on the 300 hour internship that the students are required to do, but to maybe look for some of the smaller projects, um, you know, the, the smaller things that they can get involved in. It doesn't need to be an internship to gain Experience. It could be just a project with an organization to kind of get their feet wet, which will ultimately maybe lead to an internship. And I did just see Nick chime in that PPG is actually a company that for sure is looking for freshmen. They have a great um, freshman program. And through that program, they do usually want to continue the students for um, several internships after that. So 
um, if this is a student or a parent, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not aware, but um, have your students reach out to us and, and come see us and we can get them connected for the organizations that are interested in hiring freshmen or at least give them some advice as to what they can do. Okay, and I'll, I'll take the, the data sciences major and application focus um, area. Uh, question and and yes, students are able to um, have a custom what we call custom application focus, and and that is as Sharon mentioned, she does advise students uh, with what would be appropriate for maybe a custom focus. So we do have set courses that are already established and um, have been vetted through our faculty. Um, uh, and but if there's something that is unique and different, um, we encourage that as well, right? We can't. We can't plan for everything. So, and the university is is uh, you know quite broad with the courses that they offer and the interests that our students have. So, Sharon and her team um, are are there to help with students uh, craft a custom focus if that's something that they want to do. So, yes, we we do have that available. We had a question quite a while ago from Svalono. Uh, asking what are the typical career paths for an IST grad? That seemed like a good general question to say for this panel. Okay, so I just posted a link. I'm gonna, I'm a little wonky sometimes with sharing my screen, but I'm going to try this. So give me one sec. Um, no, of course I'm having problems. Um, I did post a link um, the, in the chat that will show you um, where you can go and there's a, a section on there which I posted the link earlier that shows you to career paths and what you can do is you can um, click on like the major so if it's cybersecurity you could click on cybersecurity and then it'll drop down and show you different job titles and descriptions of what they are which I think is really helpful especially for people who might not understand the lingo sometimes it can be totally overwhelming um, so I think that is helpful. There's also another section on that page that will show you what students have done for past internships broken down by the major, which I, again, think is very helpful because we get that question a lot from parents, like what, this isn't computer science, what is my son going to do or my daughter going to do? So you can click right into that page and I can send, I'll put that direct link in the chat as well and um, see what other students have done. You can really break it down. You can, the student themselves can actually get in and look if they wanted to see this past summer or the summer from 19, what students in their exact major have done. Um, you can break it down. You can see the company name, you can see their job title and a brief description of the internship, which I think is helpful, um, not only to see what they've done, but to see maybe a list of companies, you can sort it by state and see maybe who was in Pennsylvania. Um, I just think it's a really helpful resource. So I'll share that uh, link again in the chat. And I think there was another question too, I guess earlier uh, about application focuses uh, for cyber. So just in general, any of our majors that have application focus areas can have custom focus, um, you know, areas and courses that they are taking um, so uh, I guess Nick said that he would uh, be able to answer a question from somebody who was interested in HCDD custom focus. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to mention kind of how application focuses generally work. For each of our majors, we do have a focus, um, uh, uh, the, the predefined focuses, and I think I'm sharing my screen from the undergraduate bulletin. And this is where you can really start to go take a look at where these exist. I'm going to just show the, the over in cybersecurity um, and the cybersecurity focus areas. I'm on the bulletin and I go down to the suggested academic plan section. Um, and in the suggested academic plan, it lists out all of the different courses for each semester, et cetera. You're used to probably seeing this. I hope that you are. Uh, so you can go to, to take a look at that. But if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see the list of the predefined application focuses. And here is one in healthcare for the cyber major. And you know, a student who's really interested in doing cybersecurity in the healthcare arena, here's a list of courses that you would um, uh, be able to pick from to do that predefined focus. Um, and so go take a look at uh, each one of these, except I think the, the student was asking a question about, um, was that it about cyber major with the healthcare focus or was it about um, HCDD with the, with the healthcare focus? 
can't remember. Let me just take a look. Um, yep, yeah, it was a question was about cyber and healthcare. I think that was Richard. So I hope that has, answers your your question. Sometimes you'll note that certain courses are offered at different campuses. And in this particular focus, we do have a couple of courses that are offered by the nursing school and they're, on, they're online uh, through our world campus and they have them at a couple of the other non-university park campuses as well. Uh, so just look for those uh, little notes along the way as to which focus courses are at which campuses. Um, and if you ever have questions, talk to your academic advisors and then get the, uh, the program coordinator for that major involved if you need a deeper answer. There was another question that was asked uh, quite a while ago. I don't think it ever got answered. Um, James Carell asked, what are common IST ma minor major combinations for students in engineering, computer science, BS program? Um, so I'll take a stab at that. Um, well, first of all, engineering would probably be better able to answer um, questions related to their majors. Um, that's, you know, in the College of Engineering. So um, we, we don't advise for students in the College of Engineering, but that we do have a minor. So students can complete the minors in IST or SRA. Um, that might be something that could be of interest. Uh, we don't have, um, students don't have the ability to do a double major in uh, courses that are both in uh, the College of Engineering and in the College of IST because of um, limited resources. But, um, but that's, those are probably the two, the two minors that would be best um, suited, I would think, for students in the College of Engineering. But I, again, recommend that you talk to your advisor in the College of Engineering. So is that, I hope that answered the question, but to the best. In the meantime, we have a new question in chat. Um, are internships usually applied for in the fall or is applying in the spring too late? Uh, well, it's a long question, but I'll leave it with that. <laughs> I didn't read the whole question. Um, the heaviest recruiting time is in the fall. So um, if this is not too early to start planning for a summer intern, However, spring is not too late to look for an internship, but if you're looking for a summer internship, now is when you want to start looking. Um, recruiters are actively hiring and starting to interview, and um, this is the time to begin looking, because if you don't find something, you definitely want to keep doing that through the spring. So, um, no, fall is not too early. So, and I've had a chance to read the rest of the question okay. now, and there is a second part, which has to do with COVID. and. Um, how uh, the, the, the world of Zoom is affecting internships? Um, recruiters are pretty much using you know, the virtual world to recruit. So like I said earlier, our career fair was um, entirely remotely remote. Um, we are not having employers on campus this semester, which is a little bit different. So it's definitely up to the students to take advantage of the opportunities that we're sharing with them. They get a weekly email every week that shows them the upcoming events, the virtual events um, that they need to take advantage of. And it's, again, it's up to the student to kind of jump into these calls and jump on the webinars and um, the info sessions. It's no different than if they were on campus, except they're not physically in their faces. So. It is up to them to take advantage of these. And the students who are doing that are finding the opportunity. So it really isn't affecting um, the recruiting process. It's just different. Thank you. Sure. As far as I know, we're caught up in the chat. So please anybody take uh, ask a question out loud or put something in chat. Ah, here we go. Uh, from Richard Chung, what's the difference between IST and CS? Who wants to take that? Me. <laughs> I, I love this question. Um, so, um, hi everybody, Nick Jacoby again. Um, I get this question a lot, and you know, the students are really interested in trying to figure out if I want to be in computer science, what am I going to get? If I'm going to go over and do something in IST, maybe the HCDD major, might be the closest one that you would really look at trying to, to, to differentiate between the two. Um, 
And here's what I'll tell you is that the computer scientists um, uh, are really interested in the efficiency of the algorithm. They're really interested in the correct solution to the problem. And then once they have solved that, that particular algorithmic problem or, or NP hard problem or whatever it might be, right? Um, they're very interested in saying, okay, let's, look, let's now go on to the next problem that no one has ever solved in the whole universe. Uh, so they're interested in, in algorithms, algorithmic development, algorithmic efficiency. Um, and I kind of describe that as the inside the computer perspective. Um, whereas in IST, we're kind of interested in, well, yeah, we write code and we do some stuff like that, but we're more interested in how, how people have problems that have information and technology components to them. And how do we go about solving those problems for, for people and organizations? So we, we describe that as the ITP triangle, information, technology, and people. Um, and, you know, these problems are hard. And, well, sure, the computer scientists might have come up with the right algorithm to solve the problem, but somebody has to go and actually implement it and be able to figure out, oh, here's what these users have problems with today. Um, and so I'll say that's, that's one piece of the, of the puzzle. So if you want to be inside the computer perspective or you want to be kind of um, in the applied perspective of solving problems for people in tech, uh, with technology, um, that would be the difference between the two. And I see that John Yen has uh, opened up uh, his screen. I bet he has yet a different perspective to this. Oh, no, no. I, I completely agree with you. And I just, I just awesome. want to add it that uh, for data science major, uh, the data science major actually, data sciences major is a trichology major. It includes uh, College of Engineering, actually, uh, computer science and statistics, because the major offer three options. Uh, our college uh, actually carry most of the courses, uh, and our op the option in our college is applied data science uh, option. The computer science has the computational data science option, and the statistics holds the statistical modeling data science option. And one of the questions sometimes people ask is, what's the difference between these three options? So just very quickly, that uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the data science include combination of computational and statistical method to apply to an application domain. And so depending on whether a student is uh, more interested in uh, kind of focusing on application uh, domain and, and understand how to solve problems in, from application perspective, and that would be ideal for apply data science option. If somebody is primarily interested in just uh, more on the computational method itself, not so much of attention to the application, then that's computational. And similarly, if one is primarily interested in a statistical method, not so much in the application, then it's a statistical data option. Thank you. Thank you for those great answers to a great question. Uh, what else is on people's minds? We still have a few minutes left here. I like to have awkward silences because often it takes people a moment to formulate a question. So we'll pause a little bit longer. Oh, just Jeff, I just want to mention that somebody asked me to uh, whether the slides of our presentation can be shared. So I posted uh, the link uh, on, on my Google Drive. I believe uh, everybody can download it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Jeff, this is Karen. I think there is one question in chat that we have not yet addressed. And the question is, if someone is in DUS, but interested in IST, how can they get on those weekly emails? Is that referring to the career solutions weekly email? If so, they can definitely, you can just email careers at ist.psu.edu and I'll put that in the chat and then we can add you to the weekly email. We do that with several DUS students because um, when we speak in the 110 classes, um, we always get DUS students that say, I'd like to know like what opportunities they are, there are out there with employers and things like that. So we can certainly include them. That's not a problem at all. They just need to send us an email. Thank you for putting the uh, address in there. I'd like to go ahead and chime in too a little bit. Um, we have a lot of students who start their career at Penn State uh, undecided. They're not sure uh, what they might want to do. And so they do contact the undergraduate recruiting office um, 
oftentimes. Sometimes they'll contact academic advising. Just to talk a little bit about um, what next steps might be and to get a little bit more information. So I'm going to go ahead and post a link um, to our prospective student page that actually gives um, a video tour for each of our majors, the exception being our new ETI major. We are still in process of working on that particular video, but these videos um, are real short, like a minute, 30 seconds, and they are from the student perspective. So students who either have recently graduated or are still in our college, we had an opportunity to talk with them about their experiences in each of their majors. Um, and so they are featured there. So for any student who is undecided and just kind of wants to get a student perspective, I would recommend that they go ahead and check out that page. Thank you for that. So I was, I was away from the keyboard because there was a groundhog, oddly enough, hasn't been said before. Um, but I wanted to address Richard Cheng's uh, comment, uh, even if it had been addressed, although I saw Nick addressed it. Uh, I've lived next to these two departments for a long time. Uh, IST is more interested, is more interested in applications and it's interested in certain aspects of computer science that the computer science department is not interested in. So uh, not that we're very active in software engineering, but we have some, we're interested more in databases. We're much more interested in artificial intelligence. Uh, we're interested uh, in human computer interaction and those core topics of computer science uh, as, as noted by the Association of Computing Machinery, or ACM, are seen by our colleagues in computer science as not, all caps, computer science. And so we, t we do certain topics in computer science that they're not interested in, but they tend to be fair. They could be categorized as uh, applied. And so we don't really do fundamental work in algorithms, although you know, my advisor said, you know, a good applied problem raises fundamental issues. And so, so algorithm theory, uh, operating systems for their own sake, compilers, uh, power uh, allocation within a computer uh, are topics that they cover and they're much more interested in than we are. We both cover security to a certain extent and in certain ways. How's that? Does that answer your question, Richard Chang? He said yes in the in the chat. Um, so thanks for chiming in with that, uh, Frank. I think that was a really good perspective. Um, and we're just about out of time. Um, I'd like to know one of my most recent graduate came out of computer science, so we do cooperate with them where we can. And one of the best undergrads I've had is a computer computer science undergrad. So, you know, collaboration and sharing does happen across departments, uh, not as much as some universities, but more than others. So, uh, there, there, Richard Cheng had a quick follow-up question if somebody quickly wants to answer it. I, I would quickly, I would add, while I've got the floor, that IST majors have gone into CS departments and they can legitimately claim to have had a computer science related degree, depending on what they did. Right, so the question was, do, do companies see cyber as a major or do they really want computer science people? Yeah, that's, that, that is an interesting question. And some companies are kind of like um, uh, vapor locked on a, on a degree title. Um, and there's one particular government organization that I had a nice discussion with the other, uh, actually last year at the career fair and uh, they said, oh, well, we want, at, we want computer scientists. And then I talked to their senior uh, recruiter and he said, oh my gosh, are people are telling them that? Because we really want, you know, in some roles, they want a computer scientist and in other roles, they want someone who has a cybersecurity major. I think companies are really trying to figure this out right now. Uh, and they're really trying to, to understand the, those differentiating factors. Some of our cybersecurity students um, uh, are very much in the, the, the security management space and then the use of system space. Some are very down in the weeds in terms of writing code uh, and, and implementing things that have never been created before. Um, 
And so it really, really depends on who you are. You're more than just your major. You're more than just that label. Um, you know, you're a combination of all of your experiences and all of your capabilities. So, you know, get somebody to look past just what the label is on your major. Um, and, um, and if there are companies who just can't see that, you know, shake their hand, thank, thank them very much for their time and move on to a company that does see that value. And they're, they're out there. And they're certainly the ones that come in, are coming to our career fair more so uh, than, than many others. Great, thank you very much for that, Nick. And, and I would just add to that, I think there's also been a trend over the last 10 years of increasing recognition of what uh, uh, not only IST here at Penn State, but the, the whole iSchool phenomenon uh, is, is adding and contributing uh, to the whole sector. So I think that's gonna continue to improve over time. Um, and at this point, I'd like to just um, wrap everything up here. I'd like to, um, I, I hope next year we can do all this in person rather than via Zoom. But I'd like to thank all my colleagues, um, faculty and staff alike for their generosity on a Saturday morning coming out and doing this. Uh, I think it uh, really speaks well for the school that we've got such strong participation from everybody. Um, so I want to thank everybody for that. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank the Groundhog for a very unexpected cameo. Um, so much appreciation to the Groundhog. Uh, and with that, we'll, we'll wrap this up. Uh, I think some of us might stick around in case there's some more informal uh, Q&A afterwards, but uh, uh, I think we're going to wrap this up formally now. So thank you very much.